So we now turn to the Eddington Lecture, which is one of the most uh, prestigious of the named lectures of the Society. And it will be given by Professor Karin Oberg of Harvard University. And the title is The Chemistry of Planet Formation and Planetary Habitability. Well, thank you very much. I am, of course, delighted and honored to be here. And now I'm just going to ask for about one minute of your patience while I make my laptop work. So sit still. <laughs> So Dr. Rowan Smith already kindly introduced my topic, which was, will be this byproduct of star formation that we call planets, and especially how the outcome of planet formation is shaped in different ways uh, by chemistry. Uh, so I know that for many astronomers, uh, their memory of chemistry is some awful exams they took in high school. So I'm going to try to, to keep that a level that you find interesting. But definitely feel free to, to ask as many questions uh, as you want. So there are two questions uh, that drive my curiosity and the reason that I studied this field. So this is an artist impression of a small subset of the planets that have been, dis the exoplanets that have been discovered. So planets run other stars. And you can see there's a great diversity uh, in, in planets. So why do we get uh, such different planets forming through what we think is a single process that, that planets form from. Now, uh, among this subset of planets, there's an even more interesting subset, uh, which are the so-called habitable exoplanets. So these are planets uh, that reside at just the right distance from their star and that are rocky. Uh, and we think that these are two criteria that astronomers typically uh, apply to decide whether a planet could be interested from an audience of life and current life uh, point of view. So the second question uh, that we're going to have in the back of our mind during this lecture is, well, how habitable do we think these habitable planets actually are? You can imagine that since biology has as its root, roots a lot of chemistry, this is going to be a chemical question. Now. The fundamental hypothesis of this lecture is going to be that uh, to understand planets, to understand the outcome of planet formation, we need to understand the environment within which they form. So planets form in disks of gas and dust around young stars. And my claim, uh, which I will try to defend throughout this lecture, is that the planet's bulk compositions, where you get the gas giant and ice giant, what the composition of different elements and molecules are there, um, or, and also uh, what the organic inventory and whether a planet has access to water, that those are all questions that are related to what kind of chemistry that we have in these birth disks uh, of planets. So let's start with a first question that I think most of us would want to answer <laughs> if we're thinking about the potential habitability of a planet. And that is, what is the likelihood that it will have water? Now, the reason that we define habitable planets as being at just the right temperature, it is the, just the right temperature to sustain liquid water. But of course, it's not very useful to be sitting at the right temperature to sustain liquid water if you have no water around to start with. So what's the likelihood that planets actually have water and other volatiles that we would associate with life? Well, we immediately run into a bit of a problem in trying to answer that question. And that is that we can't study water very well in these disks where planets are forming. <laughs> However, this is a cartoon on how uh, disks, uh, these protoplanetary disks, uh, fit in into low mass star formation, so the kind of star formation that led to the uh, formation of our sun. So you start with a collapse of a molecular cloud. We already saw some beautiful simulations of that. Uh, you form a, a protostar uh, to get rid of some of the angular momentum, which you always have, uh, partially because of the rotation of galaxies. Uh, you form a disk. Uh, eventually, the remnant molecular cloud evanesces, and you're left with this disk around the star, and that's where planets form. So I said, we can't really say much about the water right now um, that's, that's in these disks. 
but we can say something about the water and other volatile content uh, in the stages that's preceding the disks, that is in the protostar and in the molecular clouds. And we can do this through infrared spectroscopy, so the Spitzer Space Telescope was really important for this. Um, infrared spectroscopy allows you to uh, look uh, through clouds and protostellar envelopes where you have lots of little grains that have icy grain mantles on them. These icy grain, ma grain mantles turn out to be the main reservoir of volatiles during star and planet formation. And if you put these icy grain mantles between you and the background star, you get spectra like these, where you see these broad absorption features in the infrared, which we can, when compared to laboratory spectra, associate with different volatiles, including water. So we know what the volatile budget is uh, prior to this formation. We also have some idea of what the volatile budget is at the end of protoplanetary disks. Because in our solar system, we do have reservoirs uh, of our own protoplanetary disk that is comets. We think comets are basically ice boxes that are preserving the volatiles that were there when planets were assembling. So the idea would be, okay, so we know what's going on before disks. We know what's going on at the end state of disks. Maybe we can use those two measurements to envelope and sort of narrow down at least the ranges of possible volatile contribution, uh, volatile budgets that you can have during planet formation. So this is the result from surveys of uh, protostellar envelopes and surveys of comets. So you have the blue bars uh, showing you the typical uh, abundances with respect to water, which happens to be the most abundant uh, molecule that we have uh, during star formation, uh, except for CO. Uh, and then in the red bars show the typical abundances of comets, also with respect to water, which is a main component of comets. And the first thing to notice is that the species that have put here in the blue bars and the red bars are the same. So the same kind of volatiles that are the most abundant at the early stages of star formation are also the most abundant at the end state of planet formation. This is already suggestive that there is a chemical link between the two and that we can say something useful about what's going on in the disks. The second thing, though, that adds a bit of a, uh, of a quirk that we're going to have to deal with is that these histograms don't look exactly the same. There are some of these species, such as methane, uh, which is down by an order of magnitude in comets compared to what we see in protostars. So there seems, just from looking at these histograms, like we have some combination of, mem we have a memory of what the volatile budget looked like uh, at the onset of this formation at the end, but it's not the perfect memory. We also have some chemical alteration going on. Now, this all presupposes that it makes sense to compare everything to water. That is, that the water itself is somehow preserved, uh, preserved during this process. <coughs> now, this actually makes sense. And the reason we know this makes sense is thanks to uh, measurements of heavy water in the solar system, and especially heavy water in comets. So this is uh, a couple of spectra, a nice illustration of outgassing uh, from a comet. It shows that we can detect both normal water and heavy water, where just one of the protons is exchanged for a deuteron. Uh, now, why is, this, why is this telling us something about where the water comes from? Well, you can only enhance the deuterium fraction in molecules under very specific conditions. There are two things that you need to be present to uh, beef up the deuterium fraction in, in molecules. And they are ionization and they are low temperatures. So the way that you get, uh, that you put deuterium into water starts with having uh, a small ion, H3+, which is just molecular hydrogen with a proton attached to it. So you can imagine this is a pretty common ion. Uh, if that reacts with the, the main reservoir of deuterium uh, during star formation, which is HD, you would form H2D+, same thing. You just have a deuteron attached instead. You can, of course, have the backward reaction. I mean, this could react with molecular hydrogen to reform H3+. But if you're sitting at very low temperatures, 
this backward reaction is going to have an energy barrier, well, it's always going to have an energy barrier, but if you're sitting at very low temperatures, this energy barrier, barrier is going to be too high, and this backward reaction is going to be very slow. This just comes from differences in zero-point energy between these two molecules that are basically the same, but one is heavier uh, than the other. So once you have H2D+, you can put that deuteron into almost any molecule you would like, including water. Uh, and we know that this H2D plus is produced abundantly at the early stages of star formation because we see it. So you have H2D plus, you have some electrons around, you re recombine to form a, a deuterium atom. This deuterium atom can then take part in the process of water formation, which happens on the surfaces of interstellar grains, and you build up a high abundance of heavy water. This process, a recent realization is that this process, while very efficient in the interstellar medium in molecular clouds, is not very efficient at all in disks. Uh, you do have low temperature regions in disks, but they don't coincide with regions that have high degrees of ionization. So when we do find this very high degree of, or like very high abundance of heavy water in the solar system, that implies that a lot of it came from before the star was born. So we know that, that this water came, sort of came with us as we were forming the, uh, the, our own planetary system. Now, so, so what we know? We know that water was very abundant uh, in the early solar system because it inherit, we were inherited it. It came with us as a part of our formation process. It's reasonable to think that it was also, it's also abundant where other planets are forming. So to this first question is, how likely is it that planets form uh, environments that are water-rich? I think we are coming up with a pretty, pretty confident uh, often. It's going to be very common that planets form in water-rich environments. Then the second question is, how is this water distributed as planets are forming? How is water distributed in these protoplanetary disks? And especially, when is it going to be in the gas and when is it going to be in ice form? Only when it's in the ice is it's really going to, going to end up in planets or comets or asteroids, the kind of things we care about. Uh, th this is a schematic uh, of a protoplanetary disk. So you have the star, and then you have the disk, and the further away you go from the star, the cooler it gets. At some point, you will hit a temperature threshold where you will have a phase transition of water, where water will go from being mainly in the gas phase to being mainly in the solid state as an ice. We call this a snow line. We think these snow lines are really important for planet formation. At a very basic level, uh, we think it changes how efficiently you form planets. Uh, you can imagine the difference. Uh, so planet formation starts with little grains that we inherit from the interstellar medium, uh, coagulating and forming bigger and bigger grains, pebbles, boulders. You can imagine that it's far easier to have two snowballs and stick them together than to have two pieces of rock and try to stick them together. And because of this, uh, we think we will have much more faster, more efficient plant formation happening just outside of this water snow line than just inside of it. And very suggestively, in our own solar system, uh, we think that the water snow line happened between Mars and Jupiter and it does appear like you really got a much more efficient mode of planet formation going once you stepped out to Jupiter compared to your position on Mars. So water is a very important volatile, but we just saw from protostars and comets that it's not the only one. So if we take into account that we, not, we don't just have water, we have CO and CO2 as very abundant volatiles, what they're going to do is produce a sequence of these snow lines. So what we'll get is as we walk out, outwards in the disk, we uh, pass uh, our temperature threshold to uh, freeze that water, a little bit further out, CO2, get a little bit further out, CO. You can imagine that, that the planet that's forming uh, somewhere in this disk will have a composition that depends heavily on where it's forming with respect to these snow lines. That or if you're thinking about a comet, uh, a comet that forms out here is going to look very different compared to a comet that's assembling just outside of the water snow line. So since these snow lines affect both the efficiency of plant formation, 
and the bulk composition of planets, uh, we would really like to know uh, what they're doing. And this is something that especially is interesting uh, exoplanetary scientists who are trying to interpret the spectra of gas giants uh, around young stars. And one of the few things that they think they can get their handle on, and this is certainly going to get better when James Webb flies and hopefully about a year, but one of the few things they can already get their hands on is what the carbon to oxygen ratio is in the atmosphere of these gas giants. And they're finding some gas giants that look very peculiar in their, that they have a very high carbon to oxygen ratio. And one of the ways that these gas giants could obtain such a high uh, C to O ratio, or carbon to oxygen ratio, uh, is by forming very far out in their disks. So what this plot is showing as a function of distance from the star in the disk, you have the carbon to oxygen ratio in the solids on top and in the gas at bottom with a dashed line. And as you pass different snow lines, you will move some of your oxygen and, and or carbon from the gas into the solid. And that's where you get this shift in the carbon to oxygen ratio. So when you pass the water snow line, you move a lot of oxygen from the gas to the solid, so you increase your gas phase carbon to oxygen ratio, and so on. So if a gas giant, like a Jupiter kind of a planet, is accreting its envelope far out in the disk, it will accrete it with a C to O ratio that's close to unity. And this is something that is being used to try to interpret the formation sites of the exoplanets that we're currently detecting. But this is all good in theory. Where are these snow lines in real disks? This turns out to be really difficult to predict based on theory. Uh, when we start taking into account that this previous cartoon made it seem like it was quite easy, uh, but, but disks are not a simple system as that cartoon would suggest, where you just the disk is just sitting there, it has some temperature structure, and as you go outward, you pass temperature thresholds, things freezes out. That, that sounds pretty easy to predict. In reality, disks are dynamical systems. And one of the dynamical processes that we have in disks is that grains move around. Uh, grains move around uh, because they feel a headwind from gas, which causes them to drift inward. So the way to think about this is that if you have a solid body that's in an orbit around a star, uh, it should be uh, orbiting the star at the Keplerian velocity to be at equilibrium. Now, if you have a gas disk, it sort of wants to be at the Keplerian velocity because it also feels a pressure force. Uh, and because it feels this pressure force, it's, it's going to orbit a little bit slower than the Keplerian velocity to be at the perfect equilibrium. Now, if you're a planet, this, it's not going to matter that you have a little bit of gas that's going slower than you. But if you're a centimeter-sized pebble, uh, especially if you're a fluffy centimeter-sized pebble, you will feel a headwind from this gas, and it's going to slow you down. And as you slow down, you're going to start spiraling inward, and this drift can be very fast. It can be happening at the same time scales as the sublimation of ISIS on grains. And because of that, if, if we take that dynamics into account, you're going to start to move the snow line further and further in the more efficient this drift process is. So that's what's shown up here when you look at the rainbow. That's how much we move the snow line just by taking into account this drift of, uh, of pebbles. So it's about a factor of two, which you know in our solar system is the difference between where Jupiter and Saturn forms or between something like Uranus and the, the Kuiper belt. So these are substantial uh, distances. But it gets worse, because not only does the snow lines depend on the movement of grains, but they also depend on the, depend on the detailed properties of these icy pebbles and grains that we're talking about. And we don't know exactly what these icy pebbles look like. And by taking into account so the full range of possibilities, uh, and how much better something like CO, for example, sticks to water ice compared to pure CO ice, we, all, we can move the snow lines by another factor of two. And we take all, this, all of it together into account, you end up by an order of magnitude uh, differences in predictions of CO snow lines. So one of the, the key snow lines we were looking at.
So this is bad news if you are doing theory. Uh, but luckily, there are also observers uh, that try to uh, anchor theory. And one of the big things that has happened to people thinking about protoplanetary disks in the, in the past few years is the advent of ALMA, which Dr. Smith also mentioned. So ALMA is this amazing new interferometer uh, consisting of 66 millimeter dishes in the Atacama Desert that's all operating together as one telescope. And just to show you what the power of this is and why it has meant so, so much to us for doing disk, uh, disk work and disk chemistry work, I want to show a couple of before and after shots. So these are four images of protoplanetary disks uh, that were taken just prior to the arrival of ALMA with the best telescopes we had available to us. So the contour plots uh, show dust emission. So this would be the, the structure of the disk. You can see it's some pretty high signal to noise blobs. I mean, that's, that's what we're seeing. If we want to look at emission from individual molecules, we have to narrow in on a very narrow photon range. So that means we're going to get a lower signal to noise. So that's why instead of having high signal to noise blobs, have low signal to noise blobs when we're looking at individual molecules. So what does it look with ALMA? Well, let's start uh, with the structure first. Where there used to be blobs, we now see these fantastic ring systems, which are very suggestive since these are planet-forming disks, right? And one of the things that can carve out these <coughs> lanes and rings in these disks is our planets that are assembling right now. If we look at molecules, these will be the same molecules, same spatial scales. Uh, we're also moving away from looking at blobs uh, to looking at these spectacular ringed systems. This alone is telling you that the chemistry changes across disks, uh, which, I mean, it's what the theory said, that we should have a change in composition uh, as we move away from the star radially, but this is the evidence that that's really happening. So what about the, the, CO, the snow line? Well, I'm going to start with the CO snow line. It was the most uncertain one. Also, one is the furthest away, makes it the easiest to observe. And one of these images is actually an image of the CO snow line, and it's this nice green donut here. So the inner rim of this donut uh, tells us where CO, uh, CO freezes out, that is the CO snow line. How can we see CO freeze out, you might, might wonder. Um, well, we don't do it by looking at CO itself. Uh, we can't see solid COs, we can't see CO ice. So we have to use a proxy for that only shows up when we have CO ice in these disks. And the proxy we're using is a strange little ion, N2H+, so it's molecular nitrogen, normal atmospheric molecular nitrogen, with a proton attached to it. <coughs> this little ion turns out to be an excellent tracer of uh, CO, uh, CO snow lines because it only shows up where CO is frozen out. N2H plus forms uh, by reactions with an ion we have already met, H3 plus, and it is destroyed either by recombination or by reactions with gas phase CO. So as long as you have CO in the gas, the N2H plus will not survive for very long and you won't build up enough N2H plus to observe it. But once you freeze out CO, so you remove this, this CO gas from the, uh, from the disk, so that's what it means to, that we're beyond the CO snow line. Well, you remove the main destruction pathway of NTH plus, and suddenly you can build up very big reservoirs, and you can get these nice green donuts, which tells you where the CO snow lines are in disks. So it's really nice to have the CO snow line, but Obviously, it's not the only thing we're interested in. We also want to know where the water snow line is. And there's been re some really nice uh, work by Andrea Bansetti and colleagues uh, figuring out just that. So instead of using a chemical proxy, which is what we did, they use a dust property proxy. So it turns out that the, the dust optical properties depend very strongly on the size of, the, of that dust or the grains or the pebbles. So if you have a micro-sized dust grain versus a centimeter-sized pebble, they will have very different optical properties. And this is something that can be, uh, that is encoded here in the spectral index on this plot. Now, I already told you that grain growth is much more efficient just outside of the water snow line. 
So you will have much bigger pebbles just outside of the water snow line than inside of it. And this is something that they have seen. They have seen this very sharp transition in the spectral index, which corresponds to the water snow line location in one disk, and hopefully uh, more to follow. So to sum up this part of the talk, we know that water is abundant uh, during uh, plant formation. Uh, we have the theoretical and observational tools to figure out how it is distributed uh, in the disks. And so far, uh, what we can say is that planets form in water-rich environments. And it's, if we have a system forming like our own solar system somewhere else, it's very likely that that system too will have very water-rich asteroids and comets that can deliver volatiles like water to a terrestrial planet in that system. But water is not the only thing that we want to have when we think about habitable planets. I mean, it does define the habitable zone, so obviously we think it's important. But the reason we think water is important is because it helps us to have a rich organic chemistry. It is an excellent solvent for any kind of organic chemistry almost we can think of. And if we want to then know how many of these are habitable zone planets actually are habitable, we need to know not just if they have access to water, but also if they have access to the kind of organics that we think are important for the origins of life. Now, there are a few different strategies you can think of to answer this question. Uh, one is to uh, make full use of the very beautiful work that has been done by chemists thinking about how the origins of life could have happened here on Earth. And the most popular theory of how so the, the building blocks of life are generated, so things like the building blocks of RNA and DNA or uh, small peptides, amino acids, the, the most popular theory right now how they were generated uh, involves two, have two ingredients at the center of the chemical network. One is UV photons, and the other is hydrogen cyanide. It turns out that hydrogen cyanide was probably much better for the origins of life than it is for sustaining of life. I mean, I'm very happy that we currently do not have this infall of hydrogen cyanide-rich comets uh, to the Earth. Uh, so one question I could ask is, how common is hydrogen cyanide in the environments where planets are forming? Well, we can take ALMA and go looking for hydrogen cyanide in these protoplanetary disks, and we did. And uh, so what you're gonna see are some low signal to noise maps that show where hydrogen cyanide is in six different disks. Uh, so what's shown on the top row, so each column is a disk, different disk. Uh, what's shown on the top row are hydrogen cyanide, so actually a much rarer isotopologue of hydrogen cyanide, that is uh, H13Cn instead of H12Cn. <coughs> and on the bottom row is another isotopologue of hydrogen cyanide, but now it's the hydrogen that has been exchanged for deuterium instead of, and, and the carbon has been left intact. Now, first of all, we see the rare isotopologues of hydrogen cyanide in disks that are hundreds of parsecs away. This alone tells you that there's a lot of hydrogen cyanide where planets are forming. Uh, the other thing that you can read from these uh, two rows uh, is that there, this hydrogen cyanide must be forming in the disk. So why do I say that? Well, if the hydrogen cyanide was just inherited from the earlier stages of star formation and then it, it was sitting there, then came into the gas phase whenever it got into a warm enough part of the disk where it could sublimate. Then the two isotopologues of hydrogen cyanide, they should behave identically. These two molecules um, have the same chemistry. They have the same physics uh, up, to, up to a point. And if there was just inheritance, there should be no difference in distribution. But DCN, so this deuterated ver version of hydrogen cyanide, it can be enhanced when you are in the colder regions of the disk through, through the same kind of chemistry that I talked about when I talked about heavy water. So the fact that we do see these different distributions uh, means that it's not just a simple question about inheritance, but this is showing what's happening in the disk right now. 
So these are two points to take away. One is that this molecule we think that is essential for the origins of life, at least for Earth-like origins of life, it's common in disks. But it is forming in disks, which means that you might form very different abundances in different sources. So not all terrestrial planets uh, may be forming uh, the same from a chemical point of view. Now, this was one theory uh, on what was the key molecule to get the origins of life going. Uh, but one can be a bit more agnostic and maybe say, well, let's just see how similar these other uh, disks are to our, own, are to our own solar nebula. And I've already introduced that if you want to compare our, our own nebula uh, to other sources, you probably don't want to look at something like the Earth, which is totally polluted by life. Uh, but you want to look at something like a comet. So let's see if we can compare comets uh, to what's going on in protoplanetary disks. Well, uh, a comet is something that we can study. There are luckily many comets that come into the inner solar system, which gives us access to their composition by sublimating some part of themselves. And we have already seen that the main constituent is water, also that of CO and CO2. But beyond these main constituents, there's a large range of organics in comets. So comets are very organic rich. And among these organics are organics that have that blue ball as a part of it. So blue means nitrogen uh, when chemists make uh, little molecular models. And many of these nitrogen-bearing species fall in the same family of, the, of cyanides. So it's not just hydrogen cyanide that we have a lot of. We also have some more complex cyanides. So how could we compare uh, this collection of molecules to what's going on in disks? Well, first we have to realize we have some limitations. We cannot observe all the molecules that are here in disks. Uh, the molecules we can observe are unfortunately few enough that I can put them on a single slide without confusing you too much. First of all, we have a few, a handful of small hydrocarbons these are just molecules that only have carbon and hydrogen in them. We have another <coughs> collection that's very interesting to us, which are cyanides of different form. Remember, those also showed up in comets. And then we have a small grouping of organic molecules that have an oxygen in them. And these here are formaldehyde and methanol, so very normal molecules from a terrestrial uh, point of view. Now, looking at this image, uh, it looks like if we're going to pick one family to compare between disks and comets, the cyanide family looks like a very good place to go. If we had been really clever, uh, we would have shown this image to the ALMA Time Allocation Committee. We would have asked them for time to go and look for these molecules to be able to compare them to comets. Um, we were not that clever. We instead went and looked for some totally different molecules. But luckily, in the last minute before submitting, I decided to put a couple of extra windows, spectral windows, on these molecules here. And as a result, we, as a bit of a fluke, found out that these molecules do exist in disks, and they're quite abundant. So complex cyanides uh, are, they are present in, proto, in at least one protoplanetary disk, is what we found out in 2015. So this is the discovery image of that. If you compare the abundances that we can obtain from these spectral images, we get something that looks awfully like a comet. So we can compare the relative abundances of the hydrogen cyanide to its more complex cyanides. And in comets, it's about 10 to 1 to 1. Uh, in our disk, it's around 10 to 4 to more than 0.5. Um, these numbers come at least with a factor of a few uncertainty. So th this is a comet uh, within the uncertainties. So this one disk, this first disk that where we found this complex sinus in, the MWC 480, I said it looks like a comet in its composition. <clears throat> and that alone is already telling us that the prebiotic conditions that were characteristic of the young solar system um, are, not, are not unique. How not unique, you might ask. 
Well, we now have another five disks uh, where we have gone back and asked for the time and done exactly the same analysis. So what this is just showing is that each row is a different disk, each column is uh, either showing you just the structure of the disk or these two more complex cyanides, methyl cyanide and HC3N. And the main thing to take away is that it's detected, both of them, towards most disks. And when you do the analysis, you again get that they look pretty much like comets. So we can go from saying that the cyanide chemistry in the solar nebula that seeded comets, asteroids, potentially the Earth, with this essential ingredient for the origins of life uh, are quite common. Uh, disks that, all the disks we have looked at so far, uh, but one, and we think that it actually has more than it shows, uh, are remarkably rich in both simple and complex cyanides. So maybe you could stop here, but I don't think that would be a very good idea. Uh, I mean, we don't want to understand just the cyanide chemistry. Uh, there might be other parts uh, of the organic chemistry that are just as important for seeding the origins of life that we just haven't figured out yet. So the next step that we took is to try to think about um, what other more complex organic molecules could you expect to find in these protoplanetary disks? Now, it turns out, uh, when we're thinking about chemistry in space in general, there are two uh, sort of ways you can form molecules uh, in astrophysical environments. One is in the gas through different two-body collisions, and one is on the surfaces of these microscopic grains that eventually grow into forming planets. Uh, many molecules, including things like hydrogen cyanide, forms just fine uh, in the gas, but many others do not. And molecules that we know uh, form on grains uh, include the most common of all molecules, that is molecular hydrogen. It includes water, uh, maybe the most important molecule when we're thinking about the origins of life. And it includes a lot of the oxygen-bearing organics that we see in space. And among those are formaldehyde and methanol, the two molecules, oxygen-bearing molecules that I told you we have found in disks. Now, it's quite easy to form small organic molecules like formaldehyde and methanol through grain surface chemistry. What you do is you take a common molecule like CO, you freeze it out on the grain, and then you have hydrogen atoms coming in and just adding onto it. If you had two hydrogen atoms, you form formaldehyde. If you had four, you form methanol. If you want to form molecules that are more, are bigger, more complex, that method doesn't really work. Um, rather, the most popular scenario has been that you take something like methanol, you break it apart through interactions with UV or electrons or cosmic rays, and then the fragments walk around uh, on these icy grains until they find another fragment, and they recombine and form a larger molecule. So, if, uh, so we would really like to know if this chemistry is actively happening in disks. And the way that we're going to do it is by looking at the simplest possible product of this process, which is that of formaldehyde. So the first thing we did was to look at formaldehyde towards our favorite disk. So this is not formaldehyde. This is the, the structure uh, of, our, of a disk, the most nearby uh, protoplanetary disk, TW Hydra. Now, this looks, of course, beautiful. The resolution here is down to 1 AU, so the inset here. Uh, which is a blow up of the central region, uh, that cavity is a couple of AU across, which is very suggestive on its own. If we look towards the same disk, uh, putting it on the same scale in formaldehyde, we get something that looks different. Um, I don't want you to pay too much attention to that the image is not as beautiful. When we do look at the single molecule, we have much fewer photons, and it was really difficult to get this image. Um, but instead, I want you to focus on that there, even at this poorer resolution and poorer signal to noise, there is a clear difference between what's going on with the dust and with the formaldehyde. The formaldehyde has a hole at the center, while the dust is peaking at the center. This is exactly what you would expect if the formaldehyde is forming through grain surface processes. Because remember, CO frozen out onto the grain was part of where the formaldehyde came from. <clears throat> 
Now we can observe the same molecule towards many more disks. And what we find are basically three things. Uh, the distributions don't always look the same. Uh, but the fact that most of them have a hole means that most disks have an active grain surface organic chemistry happening. And this means both that we should have some of those more complex organic molecules and that you can expect to have different organic compositions towards different uh, planetary systems since it's actively forming in the disks and might therefore depend on the local conditions. Now, we would like to move beyond formaldehyde and actually uh, see some of the more complex species, but that is not possible with the current uh, power uh, of ALMA. So if we want to figure out um, not just, if we want to figure out whether this formaldehyde means that we have more complex organic species present, uh, we need to use two other tools. One is to look at the chemistry that we can observe in space, the more complex chemistry, which happens at the earlier stages of star formation. And the other one is to go into the laboratory and really try to simulate the chemistry that we think uh, could take place in something like a protoplanetary disk. So I just want to give you one result from a lot of work that's gone into trying to understand the complex organic chemistry that happens at the early stages of star formation. And that is that it's really common. When we look at solar type protostars, uh, they typically do have a lot of complex organic molecules. Vicinity. And these start showing up already at 10 Kelvin, so at very low temperatures. This fact that they start showing up already at 10 Kelvin is a bit of a problem, actually, with trying to explain where they're coming from. This mechanism that I showed here, where sort of fragments of molecules walking around, meeting, forming larger molecules, that mechanism only starts to work when you hit around 25, 30 Kelvin. That might seem like a small difference, uh, but it is not. It is a difference between having this chemistry turned on and turned off. So one of the things we have tried to do in the laboratory is to identify new pathways of forming these larger molecules uh, already at 10 Kelvin. One of the first ideas uh, we had um, so, so this is an image of one of the setups in the laboratory. So you see one of the first ideas we had was that maybe we can just move charge around. Uh, but before getting into the details of that, I do just want to give you an idea what we can actually do in setups like the one I showed. So what's really special about astrochemistry is that we can actually recreate our little part of the universe that we care about in the lab and then poke it around and see how it responds. So it allows us to really do experiments on it. So what we do in the lab is that we build up a very thin ices, and with thin, I mean a few molecules thick. So they are really very thin. Uh, we then expose these ices to the kind of energy sources that we have in space, including UV electrons. And then we can follow how these ices react uh, to this input of energy. And based on that, we can then dig out what the microscopic process is what is temperature dependence is, uh, what kind of energy barriers are involved, and therefore whether this, the chemistry we're investigating could happen at 10 Kelvin, for example. So, so the first th thing that we thought of as a way to form more complex uh, organic molecules was by, through so-called uh, salt chemistry. So this is a kind of chemistry where you take an acid and a base, you put them next to one another, you have a proton jump, and then you have basically electrostatic interaction between the now positively charged and negative, negatively charged ion. And the ones that we choose were ammonia and formic acid, so very normal molecules and also very abundant molecules in space. So what we did was we deposited a thin layer of ammonia ice, then a thin layer of formic acid ice, and then we stared at it with infrared spectroscopy and looked for infrared features to appear that we could associate with the salt. So what's going to show up as I start this little movie is the growth of the infrared features uh, that corresponds to the growth of this salt. So you see, with time, we do form the salt. Uh, we, can, we have a time series with how much we form, how rapidly we form it. We can model this time series with different kinds of chemical reaction models. 
Uh, in this case, we found that we needed to have a two-step model. There's a, there was like two steps to go from the individual molecules to the salt. So that means that for each experiment we run, we get two rate coefficients. Uh, we can plot these rate coefficients as a function of inverse temperature. Uh, if we run it at a bunch of different temperatures, we see how the rates depend on temperature. Based on that, you get an energy barrier. So in this case, if you get the flat uh, relation here, it means a very low dependence on temperature, and that you only get if you have a low energy barrier. barrier. So we did these experiments under a bunch of different conditions, and we found that actually we had underestimated the number of steps in the previous uh, experiments. It's actually three steps. So what, and these are very intuitive steps. What has to happen for this reaction to take place is that your two molecules have to move through the ice until they are in position. Then they have to twist a little bit so they are in perfect reaction position. And then you have the proton transfer to form the salt. Now the proton transfer itself turns out to happen at a very low reaction barrier. We could easily have that reaction happening at 10 Kelvin. But unfortunately, these dynamic interactions, this reorientation and diffusion, have too high energy barriers. And this is not going to work at 10 Kelvin. So that this way did, we came up with a different way that maybe we could form some of these complex uh, organic molecules. Um, thinking back on how we could form formaldehyde and being inspired by that. Now, formaldehyde formed, uh, if you remember, from COIs and then you have hydrogen atoms coming in, walking around, finding the CO molecule, and reacting. This can happen easily at 10 Kelvin, because atoms can move around uh, in ices at very low temperatures. So we thought, is there a way we can do an atom by atom reaction to build up chemical complexity? And I think we have found one. The one that we have found uh, is that Oxygen, it turns out, can be inserted into other molecules uh, at very low temperatures if the oxygen is in an excited state. And you easily produce oxygen in space in an excited state by breaking apart something like molecular oxygen with a UV photon. So we found that if we do expose uh, a methane and molecular oxygen ice to UV radiation, they can only break apart the molecular oxygen. We do form methanol, so by inserting an oxygen atom into the methane. And we do the same thing as before. We run this experiment at many different temperatures. And now what you should see is that there's a flat relation uh, as a function of inverse temperature. This means this reaction has no barrier. It could happen at 0 Kelvin. And it can definitely happen at 10 Kelvin. So what do these experiments mean? Now bring it back to protoplanetary disks. Well, so what we saw is that we generally have formaldehyde in disks. This means we generally have a an organic brain surface uh, chemistry happening in disks, or organic ice chemistry happening in disks. If we then have pathways to go from these simple molecules up to more complex ones that are active already at 10 Kelvin, this is not going to be the only thing we have in disks. These disks are going to be full of more complex organic molecules. So with that, I would just like to sum up that when we think about the chemistry of planet formation, um, when we think about uh, whether we are interested in how planets form, how efficiently they form, whether you form a Jupiter or an Earth, um, whether you're interested in the volatile compositions of these planets, or whether a habitable zone planet has access to water or the kind of organics we think are important for the origins of life, it's all about the question of the chemical structures that we find in their birth disks. That is, in these protoplanetary disks that are formed as a byproduct of star formation to relieve the star of angular momentum. Now, ALMA, this amazing new telescope, has revealed to us that the, the building blocks of the building blocks of ice, or of life, so not the amino acids themselves, though we think we can form some of them in ices as well, but the Building blocks of those, so the uh, hydrogen cyanide, the formaldehyde, the slightly more complex organics, that they are all, all of them are common in protoplanetary disks. Now, when we combine ALMA with observations of other parts of the interstellar and circumstellar media and with laboratory experiments, 
uh, we find that this chemistry that we see in disks, it must be a hybrid between inheritance from the previous stages of star formation and a very active, complex, organic, and volatile chemistry. And what I think the main conclusion then is, is that it's common to have the, the building blocks of origins of life available, but all disks and all planetary systems are not going to be the same. You are going to have pretty large differences, uh, probably, between planets forming around different kinds of stars, for example. And with that, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. We have a few minutes for questions or comments. I can see two over here, and then the other side. Thank you. Um, what happens in binary star? Uh, do you get interactions between the two protoplanetary disks? Does that lead to more complex yeah, chemistry? Uh, uh, it's, um, it's an excellent question. So I can't say anything about the chemistry because we haven't looked at the chemistry. But uh, I can make some educated guesses based on what we see on the structure of the disk. So actually, untrue. One of the disks here were around the binary. So it's a very tight binary. So if it's a very tight binary, uh, then we don't see any difference in the disk structure or in the disk chemistry, as far as we can tell. Uh, if it is a wide separation one, uh, so we're talking hundreds of AU, then you get two individual disks. And again, the disks are a bit smaller, but otherwise they look structurally the same. So I would guess that chemically they're very similar too. But the intermediate case is the tricky one, where, which will be very interesting to look into when you're sort of tens of AU. Uh, what's very typical is that one of the stars loses their disk pretty early on, and that you do have a circumbinary disk in addition to the circumplanetary disks. Now, this circumbinary disk is interesting because it's very far away, so it's fairly cold. But you have a lot of space between the stars and the circumbinary ring, so it might be quite exposed to radiation. So that, if there's any place where you should see a very distinct chemistry, it would be in these circumbinary rings, I would think. Um, I'd like to challenge the notion of the habitable zone. The Please. Earth's twin, <laughs> Venus, has an absolute temperature more than double that of the Earth, its temperature is controlled by its atmosphere. Yep. And this could apply anywhere. So I think that the whole thing is a totally unsatisfactory invention in the past, <laughs> which has lived <laughs> on into our time, simply because people have repeated it. Well, I will happily challenge that challenge. <laughs> uh, so when we talk about the habitable zone, uh, it should not be seen as a guarantee uh, to have um, the right temperature. Uh, the way that people typically define a habitable zone is that there are plausible atmospheres that would give you uh, the right temperature. So that means that the habitable zone um, around stars is much wider compared to where you would typically find a planet. So there's some likelihood function, but we don't know how uh, that much about early atmospheres around exoplanets that are Earth-like yet, that, that data is going to come in, is going to help us to narrow what that means. So the atmospheres matter a lot. Uh, but as far as I know, there's no, no one has come up with an atmosphere that would uh, keep water liquid if you are much beyond Mars, for example, or not keep from vaporizing if you're much uh, inside of Venus. So it sets some boundaries for further investigation. And I think that's, that's all it should be taken us. Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, so we have these complex organics in the disk. Um, do you know how well they would survive the process of planet formation, like grow through planetesimals? And would you expect a difference if you had planets form with direct gravitational collapse compared to a gradual buildup? Yes, that's an excellent question. So I'm gonna have to answer it in a few different stages because there are many ifs uh, and buts in there. Uh, if you form a planetesimal, we are pretty certain that it will survive if the planetesimal doesn't differentiate. So comets, uh, we think that there's a good portion of that that survived comet formation rather than formed in part of the comet. If you form something that starts to differentiate, uh, you will lose most of your chemical memory except for the elemental ratios, which 
depend on the chemistry, but you will lose the actual molecular structures. They will, you'll have too much chemistry happening in the planet, whether it's a gas giant or a terrestrial planet. But then there's the third case, which I think is the most interesting one, which is something like the Earth uh, likely received a lot of its volatiles from impacts uh, of water-rich uh, wet asteroids or comet-like bodies, uh, depending on how you define comet. Um, so during those impacts, I think a very interesting question is how much uh, survives them? And that's going to vary by molecules. We just did a study on the cyanides because we were interested in those. And the cyanide bond is so strong that it survives a big comet impact. But an amino acid is not going to survive. So it's going to depend on which molecule you're looking at. Let, let me ask you a question. It's probably Absolutely. a dumb one, but I will, I will risk it. When you were talking about the um, ice experiments towards the end of yep. your lecture, it, it struck me, and this is, it, as I say, it's probably stupid, but does gravity matter? So you're doing these experiments. Yeah, it, it's not a stupid question, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, so at, at, <laughs> at the scale, so we're really talking about very, very thin ices where it's yeah. molecular well, interactions yeah. are so much, so much stronger yeah. uh, than gravity. It, it so so we, we typically run our experiments uh, with ice being built up like this vertically. Some people do it horizontally, People do it differently only because of technical reasons, not because of, of gravity. Okay, good. <laughs> but but I, I, I love the questions I can answer, so <laughs> that's... <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul... When you were uh, doing the, the, the experiments with thin layer of, uh, of molecules on a substrate, how can you be sure that the substrate wasn't having a catalytic effect? That is an excellent question, and the answer is you can't, you have to test it. Uh, and we do that in different ways. So most of the experiments, what we do is actually we first build up a compact water ice that's about 20 molecules thick on top of our sort of normal substrate uh, because that is more what we have in space anyway, water being the most uh, common um, ice constituent. But there are times when we want to do things directly on the substrate, and what we then typically do is that we isotopically label different layers and see if we get a different chemistry in the layer that's the closest to the substrate compared to higher up. So, uh, and sometimes it does matter. For example, when we UV radiate an ice and we have a metal underneath, you will get electrons into the ice uh, that can travel for a little bit. So then it becomes very important to isolate the part you're interested in from, from the substrate. Final question. Thank you very much. Um, I would expect the electrostatic environment would, would, would make a, a huge difference in terms of what forms and how it forms and how fast. Uh, I may have missed it. Is there any uh, magnetic uh, impact at all, the local magnetic environment? Does that make any difference as to, as to the chemistry that goes on? Yes, it's an excellent question, which uh, I don't have a fully satisfactory answer to, but uh, let me just explain the caveats. Um, so... Uh, obviously, ions will couple to the magnetic field and neutrals will not. So you might get the partial separation of neutral and ion reactants if you are in the presence of strong fields. Now, the mid-planes of disks, which is where planets are forming, are actually very weakly ionized, which is a di different problem when it comes to how they actually accrete uh, or like move material around. So there, it's probably not going to matter. If it's going to matter anywhere, it would be closer to a disk atmosphere where you do have a high degree of ionization, which means that a lot of the chemistry is driven by ionization. Um, so there's a separate question, which uh, part of that question is that we know that grains uh, get charged uh, as well. Um, they do get pretty weakly charged, we think, though, so I wouldn't expect it to matter there, but uh, I'm not sure it can be completely uh, ruled out, but let's say we have bigger issues to tackle uh, first, but it's not something that can be completely ruled out. The hands of the clock are 180 degrees apart, which I think is a sign for us to finish. So could we thank the Edison lecturer for a tremendous talk? Thank you.